Welcome everybody. I'm Darby. I have chickens and I talk about them at the least provocation. I'm a librarian at the Nanaimo North Branch and uh, you've joined us for flowering perennials with our dear uh, Vancouver Island master gardeners and they talk about chickens way less so congratulations to you. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the Stanema, uh Stananas First Nations territory and if you want to, you can put that in the chat where you're coming from. And uh, we also want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners for uh, partnering with Furl on this program, for continuing to show up here, answering everybody's questions like the pros that they are, and um, just, just being great and inspiring. And thank you in particular to Richard Bernier, who's the man with the Hoyas that look like they're going to climb up around him and hug him. Uh, he is our uh, coordinator this year. And another thanks to Joanne Canning for having a, a great idea and following through on the partnership um, with my colleague April, who is a black screen. Okay, housekeeping items. Oh, I'm seeing some nice hellos in the chat. That's great. We've got somebody from Michigan, Parksville. It's pretty cool to see how gardening brings everybody together. We are recording the session today, but only our faces are going to be the ones in the video. We can't see you. You can see us. Your names, et cetera, will not be recorded. And uh, please keep making use of the chat feature. Um, the non-presenting master gardeners, which would be Deborah Garad and Mariah Wild, who is a master gardener in training, who's going to keep going, which is very exciting. Um, they will be uh, answering some things and putting some resources in the chat, um, but we'd prefer that you actually put your full-on question questions um, in the Q&A for the end, and then everybody can see uh, our panel handle those and learn from each other's questions. Okay. Um, I rate uh, April is going to launch a poll in a sec. So we're just curious about where folks are coming from, how they heard about this, what your gardening expertise level is, and it just helps us to uh, First off, we're super nosy and we want to see what's happening with you. And then the other thing is we'd like to be able to uh, tailor our presentations to you, our audience. Okay, so um, Richard says that everybody knows him. Um, <laughs> so if you come to any of these before, you've definitely uh, seen Richard. Uh, I might have a little bio for you. Nope, I don't. I have, I'm going to tell you about Deborah. She became interested in gardening at an early age, watching her parents, who are both in their 90s and still gardening. Yay! In 2019, she was able to fulfill her dreams of Master Gardener training and has been a member of VIMGA, which is the acronym for Vancouver Island Master Gardening Association, ever since. Her special interests are pruning and vegetable gardening. And Deborah did a great session for us last winter about pruning that you can see in the uh, back catalog that got sent out on your emails and we'll send it out again. Deborah says that she has refined her presentation and would like to do it again. We're thinking maybe in the next season. Uh, she's a retired teacher who still loves to teach and she really enjoys sharing her gardening knowledge with other gardeners, which would be you folks. And Mariah Wild is a master gardener in training. She has a background in biology and fruit and vegetable gardening. She runs an edible perennial plant nursery in central Vancouver Island called West Coast Plants, uh, where she also teaches gardening classes. Mariah loves learning and sharing what she's learned, and she's really excited to be joining us tonight for the first time. Richard, can you say a sentence about yourself? About myself? Well, I started gardening when I was a kid. Uh, basically, there was up in northern Quebec where I lived, there was a couple that lived across the street and they were in their late 60s and the garden was looking pretty sorry. So uh, they dragged me into the garden. Well, didn't drag me. They paid me a dollar an hour. So at that time, that was wonderful. I could buy a whole bunch of candies with that. 
and anyway, uh, they showed me what were weeds and what were plants they wanted to keep. And that's how I started. And I kind of lost interest in gardening until my mid-teens and then got back into it and moved to the coast and love gardening. It's a beautiful climate here. We live in God's country, <laughs> I'd like to call it. But uh, no, got involved after retirement with the Master Gardeners and got not roped into, but I enjoy doing these things with them. So <laughs> here I am. Well, it's really nice to have you and all of your plant babies here yeah. today. <laughs> So the format of the evening is Richard's got a presentation for the first 45-ish minutes, and then uh, the panel of Master Gardeners will field your awesome questions. All right, take it away, Richard. Okay, flowering perennials and everything you wanted to know, but there's a few housekeeping items ahead of time. Uh, I'm a Master Gardener, and this is... Uh, Vancouver Island Master Gardening Association, affiliate chapter of Master Gardeners uh, Association of BC in partnership with Vancouver Island Regional Library. Uh, flower perennials and everything you want to know, uh, copyright 2024, Vancouver Master Gardeners Association and Vancouver Island Regional Library. This, prop uh, this seminar is the property of Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. It is intended for education purposes only and commercial use a part of this, all or part of the seminar or its contents is prohibited without express written consent from Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and BIRL. The information in this seminar is science-based and accurate to the best of Vinga's knowledge. Use of the seminar is of the sole Dis, uh, discretion, responsibility, and liability of the user. The Vancouver Island Master Gardening Association is a chapter of Master Gardeners Association of BC, MGABC, which is part of an international organization of spe specifically trained volunteer teachers who work in partnership with the public sector agencies, private enterprise to teach, promote science-based, sustainable, horticultural knowledge and methods. Some of the information uh, in this presentation are from internet sources. These are labeled or cited. We we thank the following persons and companies for the use of their educational presentation. What is a perennial? Well, a perennial is any plant that persists for several years, usually with herbaceous growth from a part that survives from growing season to growing season. Trees and shrubs, all gymnosperms, cone-bearing plants are perennials, as are some herbaceous, non-woody uh, flowering plants, vegetable ground covers. Herbaceous perennials in cold climates typically survive winter by means of underground root or stem modifications, such as bulbs, forms, tubers, rhizomes, and above ground portions of these plants often die back in the autumn. Okay, perennials. They generally live for a few years. Some can live longer. Uh, divided into herbaceous and woody plants all have an environment they prefer. In other words, they have uh, either they like a damp area, dry area, sunny area, damp, um, shady area, part sun. They're suitable for year-round growth. Uh, you can get perennials flowering in the wintertime, hellebores flower in the wintertime, which is a very pretty flower. And some winters, they are evergreen. Some winters, they're not evergreen. Have varied foliage and flowers. Uh, if you look at hellebores, beautiful flowers. And with the new cultivars up nowadays, you can get doubles, even more than doubles, triples. They're a good investment and provide years of enjoyment. 
Look at some, look at it in the prairies. They had uh, their uh, peonies that were there for years and years and years. And if you go across some of the fields, you still find, or some of the old homesteads, you still find these uh, peonies uh, flowering. Perennials are available in many sizes and shapes. Uh, for this presentation, I'm talking about herbaceous perennials. They down, die down to the soil level each year, and these are some of the below. There's hyacinths, uh, dahlias, there is uh, lily of the valley, this is Japanese forest grass, and this is a fern. I don't know if you know about fiddle fiddleheads, but this is the fern that actually produces them. Bulbs. Tubers, corms, rhizomes, grasses, and ferns. Now, corms, um, a good example of corms would be uh, radiolas. Okay, here's some pretty typical picture of bulbs and tubers, such as in dahlias, dahlias, grasses, Corms, rhizomes. Now, a rhizome is an underground stem. And you can see this is one of the uh, shoots going off. And ferns. Now, choosing your perennials, you can have a nice herbaceous border like this. Or if you're like me, you'd have a nice tropical oasis in, the, in Qualicum Beach. Know your environment. This is really important. Climate zone. Not all perennials are uh, hardy on the island. Some actually are semi-hardy, and we'll talk about those later. Microclimates. Soil structure. Yeah, soil is important. Sun or shade. Is it moist or is it dry? Soil fertility and availability of water, which is becoming more and more prevalent in on the coast here with our dry, dry summers and uh, the lack of water. Now on your climate zone, not all perennials are suitable for your climate zone. Endoperennials or semi-hardy. Now, this could be Masubanju, which is the Japanese uh, fiber banana. There's also a canna that's actually hardy here on the island too. Fully hardy. Dry cold. Now, dry cold is important. Some uh, perennials don't like their feet wet. So they'd have to be planted in um, a well-draining soil. A wet cold, which is what's happened happens here in the winter here on the island. Length of cold, how long does the cold last? Is it just overnight or is it for a couple of days, a week, two weeks? Summertime ma uh, temperature maximums. How hot does it get and for how long does it stay hot? Winter temperature minimums. Now let's talk about microclimates. These are some of the important parts of micro, uh, microclimates. Aspect, the slope, wind protection, buildings, Fences, hedges, these are all things that contribute to uh, a warm spot in your garden. Stone walls, trees and shrubs. Now trees and shrubs actually do help uh, keep your garden warmer, uh, especially if you have a lot of taller evergreen trees and shrubs in your yard. Soil structure. 
okay, why is soil structure important? Because of the porosity of it. Uh, porosity is the amount that uh, water can travel through the soil. Uh, high porosity would have large spaces, such as in a sandy soil. Uh, low porosity would be kind of a clay, more clay soil. Soils horizons. Now, why is this important? Because if you have something with a large taproot that actually has to go through to the subsoil, then if this is really like a hard pan, well, then the roots don't have enough depth to actually tie into some of the water down lower. And uh, this, yeah. Okay, so this is our soil types. Now, the best soil type would be somewhere in the middle, a loam or a clay loam. Clay actually does keep a lot of um, nutrients because as they get leached out of the top soil level or uh, the clay will bind onto uh, the uh, micronutrients and the nutrients. Sun or shade. Well, this is, you all know this picture. This is a garden in Victoria. Jeez, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Do you remember what the name is, Starby? <laughs> oh, uh, this. Bouchard? Yeah, Bouchard Gardens. Thank you. Uh, this is semi shade, and this is uh, shaded woodland. Choosing the right specimen. Okay. Now, why is choosing the right specimen good? Because if you look here at this picture, we have one that's totally root bound and one that has good root structure and everything else. Now, you know that this probably plant would probably be fairly stressed living in a small pot with all those roots. So my preference between these two would be choosing this one where there is good root growth, but it's not packed in the soil, in the, the pot. Uh, root bound. The next one would spindly weak growth. Well, this is spindly and weak, but it looks kind of like a tomato plant that actually has dried out. But nobody would buy this, I hope. Uh, also, if you go to some nurseries, sometimes if they don't get enough water, you'll find them, uh, the tur turgor of them, not good. So that's not a plant that you want to take home with, with if it's all limp. Uh, this is damaged or diseased foliage. Now this is, uh, looks like mildew on a perennial. Next, turgor and you can see how they've wilted and everything else. Insect damage. Okay, planting your new perennial. It's important to, uh, to prepare your soil for your perennials. Mixing in some well-rotted manure in the hole that you've uh, dug also, the hole you dig should be about twice the size of the root ball. I'm mixing in some rotten, uh, some well rotted manure or compost. In areas with clay soils, uh, you don't want your perennials to be sitting in a quagmire or in water all the time. So, uh, building up raised beds or mounded beds is the way to do it. Uh, water the soil before planting. Now, this is important because dry soil does not, has a tendency to take the water out of the, the plant that you're actually planting. So do moisten the soil first, put the plant in and then re-wet. Add mulch to the soil surface. Now, adding mulch to the soil surface will also help plant at the same level as the plant came from. Read restrict, uh, instructions on bulbs, corms, and uh, rhizomes. 
uh, plant at the subject, uh, suggested depth. Now, this is important because uh, we have already talked about planting trees too deep or shrubs too deep. We know that uh, planting it too deep past, uh, above the root mass is not a good idea because it does introduce uh, what's supposed to be um, above the ground, in ground, and it's just inviting de uh, diseases, pests, and everything else into your plant. Now, pests and diseases. It's mostly self-limiting, and this is due to the herbaceous nature of plants, meaning they lose their above ground foliage in the fall. IPR. Any of you, or IPM, any of you know what it is? Well, I'll tell you. It's integrated pest management. It's a diseased making process, a decision making process for managing pests in effective commercial and environmentally sound way. An integrated pest management approach can be used for crops, livestock, pest management, and in the home garden. Now, what does this entail? Right plant in the right place. And what do we mean by this? Well, uh, Lobelia uh, cardinensis, which is um, likes a very nice um, moist soil and it likes part sun, part shade. But you wouldn't be planting uh, euphorbia in that space because you know it wouldn't do well because euphorbia is light draining, uh, well draining soil and they do like full sun. A watering schedule. Now, why is watering schedule important? Well, watering in the evening allows the water to sit on the plants and then you're asking for problems. You end up with uh, fungus and uh, mold growing on the leaves. So my suggestion to you would be watering in the morning. And uh, that way the plants will dry off and they won't be sitting overnight with water on them. Oops. We could check for pests and diseases. Now this means just going out into your garden and looking and looking for damage on plants, looking for holes in leaves, looking for uh, munched edges. Uh, if you've just planted some seedlings, uh, seedling perennials, and they all of a sudden are fall, uh, have fallen over, well, it could be a pet worm. Now, what do I mean by cultural controls? Cultural controls is something that you have control over. Growing in perennials in the uh, conditions they prefer. Again, right plant, right place. Keeping your soil healthy with plenty of organic matter. Now, this invites good critters, that uh, worms and everything else into your soil that actually aerates the soil, breaks it up. And you have the added benefit that it cools the soil in the summer and keeps it warmer in the winter. Preventing, uh, planting disease resistant varieties. Yep, there are some uh, resistant uh, plant cultivars that will not, uh, they're resistant, not proof. Proper spacing, so there's good air circulation in the light. Remove plants that are constantly decimated by the same pest every year. And here on the island, we have daylilies, and there is the daylily uh, golf midge that actually will eat. Uh, you'll get a flower, but the flower is all distorted and everything else. So if you have that in your garden, well, it's going to come back every year. So why plant it? Take it out and choose something that's more resistant. Remove and destroy diseased plant materials. Now, this is important. Uh, 
for the fact that you don't want to leave this on the soil. Uh, if you have one leaf that's uh, got a fungus or something else on it and you leave it on, well, chances are that fungus will spread to some of the other leaves. And before you know it, your uh, plant is um, not looking so good for the year. Keep your tools clean. Yep, that's important. Uh, treating them with, uh, spraying them off with water, uh, using um, an alcohol-based cleaner on them. No, that's pruning tools. Uh, same thing with your shovels. Tidy up in the fall. That's always a good idea. I don't leave uh, some of this on the soil. Now, I'm not saying don't leave it on. Uh, through late late summer, early fall, allow the uh, goodness in the leaves to go back to the uh, the bulb or the roots, and then uh, clean it up after afterwards. Physical controls. Now, what do I mean by physical controls? That's something that you go out in the garden and do it on your own, picking. <laughs> The insects off by hand. Yeah, some of us have time to do that. Some of us don't. Some of us are retired and some of us are still working. So whatever you do, picking them off is always a good idea. Barriers to stop the insects from getting on the plants. Now, uh, as you know, we have lots of slugs here. So you can actually put uh, diatomatous earth around your uh, some of your uh, hostas, and it works where the actually slug or uh, snail sort of goes over it, and uh, it's so sharp these things that uh, the actual diatomatous earth is so sharp that it actually uh, scratches their pseudopod, and with that, they slowly desiccate. A little cruel, but that's fine. I'd rather have nice hostas than a bunch of dead slugs. Traps that either catch or confuse the insects. Now, uh, or slugs, beer, in, uh, in, um, whatever, uh, plastic container that's open so they can crawl in. Or you can get insect traps that actually help. Other traps like uh, yellow um, sticky tape that actually will remove any of the white flies and that kind of stuff. <laughs> yes, deer and rabbits. Don't we just love them? <laughs> Not. My last property, I had a six foot fence with barbed wire along the top and guns at each corner. So those damn bambies didn't get into my yard. But uh, unfortunately, I had some work done in the yard and they left the gate out. Gate opened and in struck the bambies. Now, biological controls. Make use of natural predators, birds. Invite birds into your yard. They love eating bad insects. Snakes, mm -hmm. snakes. I remember a story where I, I, actually not a story, I'll tell you a story. I had snakes in our yard and Dwayne didn't like them because I had a pile of rocks there. And he came out one day and just shrieked, there's a snake on the ground. Here I'm coming wondering what the heck's happening. And it's this little baby garter snake. I said, Dwayne, we're not getting rid of it because it eats the slugs. It's staying. Well, I did win that argument. Frogs. Mm -hmm. Frogs eat uh, bugs. Spiders. Mm. Yes, spiders. Ladybug beetles. Great for aphids. Wasps, yep, wasps are good in the yard too. 
they will eat all kinds of harmful insects. They will take caterpillars out of your trees. They'll prey on uh, aphids. Always a good idea to have them in the yard. And I know people don't like them, but guess what? They're all part of God's little world. And yeah, certain bacteria also. BTK, which is a bacteria which is used to control uh, caterpillars. Ah, here's some of our pests. Aphids, beetles, borers. Now, a borer actually goes right into the, uh, the stem and um, actually will destroy your plant for the year. True bugs, cutworms, grubs, leaf miners. You've all seen uh, a leaf that looks like it's transparent. Well, uh, a little bug has gotten into there between the top and uh, bottom layer of the leaf and just munched away. There's our slugs and snails again. Spider mites. Rips, white flies, and there's our famous deer and rabbits again. There's some aphids, borers, cutworms, leaf miners, beetles, bugs, that's a stink bug, grubs, slugs, and snails. Spider mites, really hard to see. What you need to do is you need to get a small magnifying glass and look at it really closely. You'll see little, little spiders and you'll see webs. White flies, it can be a problem in late summer or if you have a greenhouse and some, you can see them in there too, thrips. And there's our deer and rabbits again. Okay, some of the diseases of perennials. Anthracnose, aster yellow, botrytis blight, leaf spot, now it can be either bacterial or fungal, mildew, nematodes uh, that produce root, root knot, rot, rust, Sooty mold. Now, sooty mold is because if you have aphids in your tree above you, above the um, perennials, and then you're likely to get sooty mold on your your plants. Viruses and wilt. Okay, anthracnose is a disease caused by a specific species of fungus. And there, it's a name given to a group of fungal diseases that infects a wild a wide variety of herbaceous and woody plants. Infections of anthracnose disease are distinctive and appear as limited lesions on stems, a leaf stems or fruit. In leaves, some and in some of the fruit, uh, lesions are awfully, uh, often angular and follow leaf patterns vein patterns, sorry. Uh, secondary pathogens can then invade the dead tissue, typically cause some stem dieback, uh, premature leaf and a fall or fruit rot. Multiple infections in the same area where lesions can coincide, co and they grow together, may result in a stem and leaf blight. Now, the ones that are particularly uh, susceptible to this would be Virginia, uh, Hosta, Rudbeckia, Fox, Fox, Polygoniums, and Dianthus. Now, I had never heard of this next one, yellow, uh, aster yellow. Now, it's... Uh, shows as malformed flowers with petals that are abnormally green colored, mass of abnormal brushed like shoots, 
small abnormal flowers arising or close to the same point, witch's broom. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a witch's broom, but if you're walking through the forest, you can see what witch's brooms look like. It grows off the side of the plant and does not resemble the plant in any way or the tree or shrub. It's sort of, if you've got a tree growing straight up, this thing grows off the side and is multi-stemmed and it looks really strange. And some of the new uh, some of the new cultivars or some of the new uh, plants that you do see out there are witches' rooms. Uh, abnormal production of adventitious roots. So in other words, you can get roots growing on the stem, which is not, you don't want roots in the stem. Uh, yellowing and stunting of plants, wilt and dieback, and the plants that are actually uh, uh, will get this would be asters, sneezeweed, and echinacea, and there are others too. Next one, botrytis blight. Now, you don't see this very often, but I see it sometimes in my greenhouse if it gets just a little too damp or there's uh, not enough air circulation. So what I've done is I always have a fan going in my uh, greenhouse. But out in the open, uh, the only thing I can tell you is this is normally at the end of the season where it's cool and stuff, is good uh, sanitation. Uh, also, if your plants, your perennials have some space between them, it's always good. Some air circulation. Botrytis uh, is a fungus that infects many greenhouse ornamental and vegetable crops. Botrytis cause leaf spots, Ablating stem cancers and dampening, and dampening, dampening off. Botrytis produces large masses of gray uh, condita and spores, hence the name gray mold, uh, that can be carried on air currents to healthy plants where blight can become established. Infections can start as a small leaf spot and quickly coalesce into a large necrotic area infect the cut stem surface, stalk plants, progress downwards basically and cause dieback of the entire plant. Uh, the ones that are really um, susceptible to this are begonias, peonies, and geraniums. Lee spot, bacterial or fungal. Now, typical uh, leaf spots caused by bacteria appear as water-soaked brown to black lesions, often outlined with yellow halos. Water-soaked, sometimes called greasy spots, often appear on the underside of the leaf first. Necrotic spots may be angular or somewhat round. Spots may coalesce and cause blighted appearance in some hosts. Now, the plants that are uh, susceptible to this are astilbe, chrysanthemums, delphiniums, heuchera, and marigold, and rudbeckia. Mildew. Now, mildew happens in late, late summer, early fall. It's not really about uh, wet leaves, it's more about high humidity that we get at that time of the year. Uh, it's uh, a disease that occurs on above ground plant parts, especially leaves, many herbaceous or mental plants, as well as deciduous trees and shrubs, outdoor, indoor house plants, and many horticultural uh, arch, uh, crops. Pottery mildew is caused by several closely related fungi that survive on the plant, debris, or infected plants. These fungus are fairly host-specific pottery mildew fungus that affects one type of plant is not the same pottery mildew fungus that it affects another plant, i.e. Li lilies or uh, lilacs, sorry. However, if you see powdery mildew on one plant, then the water, uh, the weather conditions are usually high humidity and are favorable to the development of the disease on a wide range of plants. Dahlias, 
or dahlias, chrysanthemums are or phlox are susceptible. Nematodes. This is a picture of uh, nematodes uh, or the galls that are produced. Swelling or nodules on plant roots can indicate root knot nematodes. Now that's not to be confused with on legumes where you have these nodules that actually have uh, beneficial bacteria uh, that uh, actually produce uh, nitrogen for the plants. So it's like a, a fertilizer that's right there by the roots. Symptoms spread uh, through the site as the season progresses and succeeding generations of juveniles hatch out. Prevention and biological control are keys to success in managing this pest. Keep weeds down, rotate susceptible crops and avoid planting them for a few years. Pull up badly infested plants. Some green manure crops, cover crops such as mustard rape, produce compounds that suppress uh, root knot nematodes, enhancing the biological uh, activity in the soil through incorporation of compost can also help suppress root knot nematode populations. And susceptible uh, perennials are asters, delphiniums, uh, echinacea, some irises, and lobelia. Rot. Mm -hmm. Crown and uh, Root and crown infection first appears, appear as wilting or collapse of the plant. Early detection of inf infected plants includes scouting for plants. In other words, going out through your garden, having a look, the same as you would do for pests, and uh, scouring the plants for either wilt or collapse during periods of wetter, uh, water stress. Uh, cr chronically infected, uh, infected plants may be uh, stunted or off color. Inspect root systems by gently tapping the plant out of their pots and inspecting for excessive soft, dark, or uh, off colored root tips. And um, when you're choosing your perennials, look at them. In the uh, nursery, just pull them out of the pot and you know, look at the roots. You're not only looking at the roots themselves if they're pot bound, but you're also looking for pests. Root rotting pathogens uh, will often cause other outer tissue to be easily pulled off the central core. Crown rots will cause the plant to easily fall over and allow the plant to be easily pulled out of the plant. Now, uh, susceptible uh, perennials would be lavender, delphiniums, hosta, heuchera, and euphorbia. Next one, rust. Now, we've all seen rust on hollyhocks. That's why we don't generally grow them here in the island. If you, you can plant them, if you plant them on a nice sunny um, east or south side of the house, up close to the house, under the eave, so that they won't actually get water splashed on them. And if you have a good organic mulch on the ground, uh, you should be able to keep this uh, at bay. Uh, symptoms of infection usually appear as light colored spots on the upper leaf surface, followed by rusty colored areas of spores, either on the upper or lower leaf structures, goldenrod and geranium. Rubbing these with the index uh, finger or onto a piece of paper will leave a rusty colored smudge. Uh, rust disease can be quite complex and may alternate between hosts of different genera or remain at the same host during their life cycle. Alternate hosts may include weed species another reason for weeding. Keep your beds free of weeds. Uh, perennials commonly attacked by root fungus include asters, dianthus, hollyhocks, irises, and lava. Malva, sorry. Sooty mold. 
City mold, you've probably all seen this on some of your perennials, especially if they're under trees or shrubs that have aphids on it. Basically, these aphids uh, suck the sap off your tree and they will actually uh, spit it out their backside. And that um, do, I guess you would call it, will stick to the roots, uh, to the leaves. And that invites the sooty mold to take, uh, to start a foothold basically. Black mildew or sooty mold are often used interchangeable interchangeably, though city mold should be used for the black mold that grows on insect excrement, excrement honeydew, uh, that can coat the leaves, stems, or fruits of plants. The mold is not parasitic, but can reduce the leaf's photosynthetic ability by blocking out the light. So in other words, it gets pretty thick on the leaf. It is common indication that the plant is in infested or with piercing, sucking insects such as aphid scale, mealybugs, white flies. Sooty mold can be removed by washing it up with warm soapy water. Controlling the insects that cause honeydew uh, is required for long-term control. Viruses. Now, we don't really see a lot of viruses. Uh, on the island. The one is, is the tobacco uh, mosaic virus, and it can cause uh, distortion in the leaf shape and the color of the leaves. Uh, actually, some viruses uh, are already, um, okay, to get some of the newer cultivars of uh, variegated foliage, they are viruses in the plant that cause this variegation in the in the plant itself. And uh, as long as it does not destroy the plant and just causes this variegation of the leaf, then they allow it to continue and we come up with a new cultivar. Although it's virus infected, it is pretty. Uh, symptoms of virus infection include necrotic spots, uh, spots abnormal dark green foliage, uh, light green mosaic or mottling leaves, growth distortion, stunting ring patterns or bumps on plant foliage, and abnormal flower coloration or formation. Plants may be infected with more than one virus or viral strain. Plants infected with multiple viruses can show a combination of symptoms or more severely symptoms that can result in multiple infections. There is no cure for infected plants. Uh, remove, discard infected plants. Weed control and sanitation is important since weeds and plant debris can serve as a source of viral infections. Eliminate the weeds can, uh, that can act as re reservoirs of the virus where aphids and larval thrips and nematodes can acquire the viruses. Now, uh, delphinium and peonies, but there are other ones that uh, are uh, susceptible. Wilt. Wilt. Now, it can be bacterial or fungal and enters the roots and stems of the plant causing stunting, wilting, and death by plugging the vascular system. This is called vascular wilt. Infected plants wilt and die. If you cut the stem, vascular tissue shows discoloration as tan, reddish, or dark streaking. Silver fungi or bacteria may cause vascular wilt, uh, wilts on herbaceous plants. The primary means of introducing these pathogens is by purchasing infection in infected plants that are showing not showing symptoms. These fungi can remain in the soil for years. Once the disease appears in a particular growing area, you must not plant a susceptible plant or take cult or take other cultural methods to reduce uh, future losses. Some of the plants that are susceptible, monkshood, snapdragons, asters, dahlias, or dahlias, and peonies. 
Now on to propagation. You can grow perennials from seeds. Stem cuttings, cutting stem cuttings, basal cuttings, root cuttings, and rhizomes. Divisions, non-dividing perennials. Okay, propagation of seeds. It's important to use a sterile uh, starting mixture. In other words, don't take the soil from your garden. Buy uh, commercially available or mix one up yourself. Uh, you can use a core and with a vermiculite, which makes uh, a water retentive, but still drains and it, it has a multitude of pores that will retain some of the water and uh, the fertilizer. Now, uh, sterile mixture, keep the soil moist, not wet. Use bottom heat for those that require it, anywhere between 14 and 21 C. Use a dome cover to retain moisture. Oops, kind of a spelling error there. And heat. Watch for dampening off. Some seeds require a period of cold or soaking in water. It's just stratification. Surface on some need to be scratched or nicked, which is scarification. Okay, stem cuttings. Generally taken in the spring or fall, do not use growth that has flowers on it because the plant will want to put all its effort into the flower and not into the rooting. Cut, cutting should be about two to 10 centimeters in length. Use healthy new growth uh, with one or two nodes below the so soil surface. Now a node is where the leaves actually appear on the plant. And uh, so basically, if you're looking at a stem where the leaf goes onto it, that's where you will see the node. Propagation from stem cuttings. Uh, generally taken in the spring and fall, do not use gross uh, right. Keep uh, two or three leaves uh, on the cutting. Use a, roting, a rooting hormone, greatly increases rooting. Keep it moist and use sharp and ster sterilized knives. Now, some of the plants that will uh, can be propagated from stem cuttings are artemisia, basket of gold, bellflower, bleeding heart, candy tuff, catnip, syncophoia, uh, clematis, coreopsis, cornflower, cushion spurge, micola daisies, Mullion, Penstemon, Pinks, Rotcrest, Sedum, Autumn Joy, Snow in the Summer, Thyme, Veronica, Violet, and Yarrow. Uh, from root cuttings. Hey, root cuttings. Must be kept fairly dry. So in other words, you don't want these sitting in water. Uh, cuttings can be taken from fleshy uh, roots of some perennials, must be kept in the same orientation when planted. So in other words, the proximal end should be above the distal end. So the proximal end is the one that's closest to the stem. Distal end are the ones that are closer into the soil. Uh, best, okay, best root cuttings are those that are not fine or old, so something, uh, not an old root, but not one of those little fine roots. Uh, use root cuttings, two and a half to five centimeters. Remove any side roots and keep in a warm place out of direct sunlight. So these would be actually put on a soil surface and just sprinkled uh, with um, some uh, medium on top of it. Now the perennials that you can propagate from root cuttings are baby's breath, bear's breech, black-eyed Susan, bleeding heart, evening primrose, Japanese anemone, mullion, oriental poppies, phlox, 
primrose and sedum. Rhizomes. Rhizomes are fleshy stems that grow along the soil surface. Now, you've probably seen some of the grasses that grow that way. Well, uh, that's a rhizome. So if you take a piece of that, uh, you can produce a new plant. Take cuttings when the plant's vigorously growing. Make sure that you have one or two nodes. Use a sterile starting mixture. Always use a sterile starting mixture. Lay the cuttings on the pot of, uh, potting medium. Do not completely cover with starting mix, but keep moist, not wet. Uh, and the ones that we can use, uh, cuttings, rhizomes, would be bellflower, virgia, cornflower, cranesbill, uh, geranium, iris, lily of the valley, or wild ginger. Propagation from division. Now, division would be something that's a big clump, and you can normally tell uh, a clump forming. Rejuven this will rejuvenate a large clump. Signs that the clump needs to be divided. Center of the plant has died out. Plant no longer flowers well. The plant is encroaching at other plants. Begin with digging up the clump, break the clump into smaller sections, replant one or two in the original hole, take the opportunity to add organic compost to the planting hole, water well for the first season or until it's actively growing. Now, some perennials that you can do uh, would be all the clump forming, but some of the non- um, I'm forming like baby's breath, balloon flower, cushion spurge, hosta, Japanese anemone, uh, ladies mantle, oriental poppy, peony, Russian sage, and trillium. These are the ones that can't be uh, propagated by division. Uh, let's go on to care of perennials. Weeding. Yeah, who knew? Who knew? These compete with your perennials for light water and nutrients. Mulching uh, prevents weed seeds from germinating. Soil remains a constant temperature. More moisture is retained in the soil and prevents soil erosion. Now in, uh, on the island here, we do get heavy rains in uh, the winter time. So this would actually keep the soil in place. Um, it keeps the plant from looking at tidy, keeps the plants from spreading seeds. Oh, sorry, uh, deadheading. Pruning. This actually will produce a more compact, compact plant. It'll actually make the plant look bushier and you will get more flowers. They will be slightly smaller, but you'll get more flowers. Staking. Now, I'm sure we've all had delphinian, delphinians in the garden and with these being so tall, they have a tendency to fall over. So staking is really important. Also, you find on some of the um, peonies they need staking or at least a peony ring around them because the flowers are so heavy that they just fall to the ground. And you know, you're not actually seeing the flower if it's on the ground. Hey, these are perennials with interesting seed heads. Stilby, Clematis, False Simon, uh, Simon's, uh, Solomon's Seal, Goatbeard, Meadowsweet, Oriental Poppies, Purple cone flower, Russian sage, sedum, autumn joyce, and most grasses. Now, I've always liked to keep my grasses, the seed heads in the grasses, and the reason for it, I like the way they sort of bend in the wind in the, in the, uh, the fall, and it, it just sets up um, something visual in the, the garden. Perennials that self-seed, ajuga, bleeding heart, Blue star, cardinal flower, lobelia in other words, 
uh, forget-me-not, hollyhocks, ladies' mantles, lupins, mullion, uh, mallow, mullions, pink, rose campion. Don't ever take this into your yard. You'll never get rid of it. It just produces prodigious amount of seeds, and the seeds last forever. Stonecrest, sweet rocket, and violet. Here's some perennials that you should shear back after blooming. Asomnia, uh, baby's breath, blanket of gold, basket of gold, candy tuff, creeping phlox, cornflower, bellflower, blue star, cranes bill, geraniums, golden marguerite, lamnium, rock crest, snow in the summer, stone crest, uh, sweet woodruff, thyme, and yarrow. Perennials to uh, prune in early season would be Artemisia, uh, bee balm, black eyed Susan, catnip, cornflower, mallow, uh, mallow, sorry, McClellan, uh, daisies, pearly everlasting, rose mallow, sedum autumn joy. Care bulbs. Now, enjoy the flowers in the spring. Beautiful flowers. Spent flower, uh, remove spent flowers after blooming because you want whatever the leaves are producing to go back into the bulbs. Uh, low, allow the uh, foliage to go dormant before removing. In other words, if you've got um, uh, daffodils, allow them to go yellow and then remove them because all the, these leaves are going to be producing uh, the starch that goes into the bulb will produce flowers next year. Uh, top dress with compost in the spring before the leaves appear. Some, especially tulips and hyacinths, may not bloom as well in subsequent years. Beware of deer, squirrels, and raccoons. Squirrels dig up the, the bulbs, corms, raccoons do the same thing. And the deer, once the bulb comes up, They'll eat it. They'll eat the flowers on it. Uh, although they will not eat um, daffodils. Plant native bulbs, camas, trout lilies, which are native here on the coast and have a really lovely spring, add spring color. Uh, introduce, instead of tulips, choose botanical tulips that will continue to bloom for many years. Flowers are really small, but in ma on mass, they look really good. When the bulbs get crowded or dormant, they can be dug up and replanted in a different location. <laughs> We've all had this problem. Beware of friends bearing gifts. Do your due diligence. In other words, if somebody gives you a plant, look at it with um, an eye for either disease, bugs, or actually uh, Google the plant so that you're not putting a fug into your yard. You can introduce pests and diseases into your yard by uh, friends giving you cuttings. Aggressive plants. Invasive species. We already have quite a few plants on the island that are deemed invasive. Uh, periwinkle is one of them. Uh, where they tell us not to plant it anymore or put it in an area that actually is enclosed so it can't get loose. What may have been a well-behaved plant in their gardens may be a bug in yours. So in other words, if they don't water and a plant stays really nice and small in their garden, but you water and you fertilize, well, that plant will become a thug in your yard. So beware of it. Now, I guess I'm done. Here's some of my references, perennials of uh, British Columbia, Alison Beck and Marianne Benetti, Heritage Perennials, Perennial Garden Guide by John Value, West Coast Gardening, Natural Insects, Weeds and Disease Control by Linda Gilkison, 100 Best Plants for Coastal Gardens by Steve Weissall, Sunset Western Gardening Book, 
and the photo credits were given throughout this presentation. Great. There we go. How did I do for time? Ooh. Not too bad. <laughs> Ran a little. Over. Okay. So this is the fun part where all of your questions in the Q&A that are there and that might end up being there uh, get answered by our panel. Um, shall we start? Yeah. Yes. Lynn asks, how do you handle the perennials that are a sub-shrub type, salvia, lavender? How do you handle them in what way? I'm not sure. Um, some of them actually you can cut back if they're evergreen in your yard or they grow back from the, uh, from the stems and stuff like that you can cut them back uh, to make them actually more tidy and stuff like that what i would do is suggest that you cut out some of the older growth and allow some of the newer growth the side growth to actually uh, grow and produce flowers and stuff like that okay could I chime in on that one? Yes, yeah. please. Um, please actually, do. with lavender, you really do need to cut it back. You need to prune back about a third into the green every year. If you don't, the plant just continues to add green to the tips. And pretty soon you end up with a very bare woody interior. And then you have a, a plant that's kind of sprawling and not very attractive. So if you prune your lavender back, Ignore the stems with the flowers, but prune back into the green about a third. And you can either do it in the fall after it's done blooming, or you can wait and do it in the late winter, either one. And then it'll sprout new growth, but it'll stay nice and compact, and you won't get those woody, unattractive stems if you do that. Uh, salvia, I've never had salvia make it through the winter. Uh, it always freezes, the top freezes, but I live in Cumberland, and that's a little farther north. Yeah. But I also have them come up, seedlings come up every year from the ones that that have bloomed the year before and then froze to the ground. So I have sal salvia that actually comes up and has formed a little sub shrub. So what I have done is actually exactly what Deb, uh, Deborah has suggested. It's cut down about a third of it and cut out some of the older growth to rejuvenate the clump itself. And yes, it can be... Uh, a woody perennial in some gardens, but other gardens, it isn't. Right. Right. Uh, again, it depends on your zone, how far you are away from the water, how high you are in elevation, and all these. Or if you have a microclimate in your your yard. Mm -hmm. Follow up question: um, Richard was talking about shearing things. Is lavender one that you would shear, or is it? Yes. Yes. You just shear it about a third of the, they're already sort of a round kind of a shrub sh shrub shape. So you just shear about a third of the green, just right off. Don't cut down into bare wood if you can help it. Sometimes they will re-sprout from bare wood, but you don't know if they're going to or not. If you shared it right down to just bare wood, you might kill it. So what tool yeah. would you use for that? Uh, it depends. If you have a lot of lavenders in your yard, a little electric hedge trimmer is a great thing to use. If you don't have very many, just use uh, my Suckers. kitchen scissors. I use my kitchen scissors because they have mm -hmm. a nice straight blade on them and they're really easy to use. Um, but yeah, I, if you have a lot of them, I, electric hedge trimmer is the way to go because you'll wear out your hand otherwise. Right. Yeah, you I better use, have a hedge trimmer. Yeah, what I use is those... Uh, hedge trimmers like the the ones that are like big scissors basically yeah they work too i don't have those so edward scissor hands <laughs> yeah trimmers. okay great all right thank you very much for that folks um let's do one more pruning one can one prune tree peonies of course you can you or can trim it yes <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't trim it past the uh Bud Union. Basically what they've done is most tree peonies are actually um, grafted onto a, a herbaceous peony root. So uh, you can take the some of the top growth off, but don't go past 
because basically you've no longer got a tree peony. You now have this herbaceous peony that actually is whatever the rootstock was, and it will not resemble what's above it. The other thing is you can get suckers off of the herbaceous roots. So now you've got this tree peony with all this other peony uh, subgrowth there. So I would actually try to keep any of the offshoots off, but keep the actual tree peony uh, graft itself. And, and if you want to control the size of the, uh, the top part, the leafy part, um, rather than do shearing, which a tree peony is probably not going to take very well to shearing, then you're going to have the lollipop effect. What you would do is you would choose the longest branches that you want to get rid of, and you would follow them right back to their point of attachment to either a larger branch or the trunk and clip them off there. And do that to several of the ones that are the longest, and that will bring the size of the whole thing down while maintaining the natural form of the plant. The other, the other thing is don't leave the seeds on of the seeds seed pods because those seed pods are actually taking nutrients or starch from the root and the following years you may not get as many flowers or you know it can stress the plant too yeah if you if you want to collect the seeds because you want to start them leave one seed pod but take all the rest off yeah yeah excellent uh, we had a follow-up question about my she my shearing follow-up question to the other one. Um, she was asking, can you share it? Can you divide lavender? Uh, uh, no. 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 It's one of those non-dividing perennials. Uh, basically, yeah. what you can do, though, is if you don't shear it in the the fall and allow the seed pot of the, the flower, the old flowers, on the plant, you can get little seedlings. And I've had that happen many times where I planted the lavender, the plant has actually expired because of mismanagement on my part. Yes, I do mismanage sometimes, <laughs> but you can get all these little seedlings growing up. Yeah, actually I get little lavender babies all over my yard every year. Uh, I don't cut off the flower stems and buds until way into fall, because even when they kind of turn gray, I still think they're really pretty. So yeah, I leave them. Eight. So then I end up with seeds everywhere. They take a long, uh, quite a while to germinate. So you just kind of have to just notice when they pop up. But gosh, they'll grow in gravel. They'll grow in the most inhospitable place that you've ever seen. And they're quite easy to transplant. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's if you probably look at, if do. you look at where their natural habitat is, it's gravelly soil, it's rocky, gravelly soil. dry, yeah. very drought tolerant. Yeah, very right. drought tolerant. In fact, if they're in uh, wet ground all winter long that is not well drained and their roots are wet, they rot. rot and they'll just die. They they so, like again, know your plant, know right. what environment it likes, right plant, right place. Yeah. We're all going to be looking for lavender babies now. Uh, okay, question. When is the best time to trim tree peonies? Uh, probably oh. fall. Well, yeah, do you fall, want to... fall or late winter, either one. Yeah. yeah. Because you can normally tell some of the buds will actually start budding early depending on the season itself, you can get the buds starting to swell as early as February, right? So if you're going to prune, don't prune those buds that are going to be, unless you're doing, you want to revamp the plant itself. I then would, I would do it right after blooming, I think. Uh, yeah, that's a have good. a chance to grow and make new buds before fall, mm -hmm. before winter, yeah. I like hearing that there isn't like just one right answer sometimes from you folks. Oh yeah. Like, whatever yeah. I do is and probably you, gonna be okay. And then you develop your own preferences as well. Exactly. Hearing. And you know, depending on your climate, where you are, how far are you away from the water and everything else? Like here in Vancouver Island, right by the water, you're probably at a nine A. But where I am right now in Qualicum Beach is 8B. And where you are, uh, Deborah, is probably more like a 7B. Well, 8A, more moving towards 7B. 
with climate change and the colder snaps in the winter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, we've got a few soil questions to answer. I have a lot of clay soil in my yard. Is it best to build up with wood chips or something else for the winter? I'd like to see Mariah answer this one. Mariah knows yeah, about Mariah is good at this. That's good because Mariah wants to answer. <laughs> Go for it. I, I, I made a list for you of all the reasons why I think wood chips would be a great thing for clay soil. Uh, organic matter is the best fix. People used to think that sand was how you would get more drainage in clay soil, but really adding organic matter is a great option and the wood chips will do that. Uh, they will also reduce compaction. Clay already wants to be very compacted, but in the rains in the winter, that can cause the soil to get even more compacted. So it'll slow the rains down. It'll increase the uh, pore size, as Richard referred to, in the soil. So there'll be more airflow and more water flow. And we know that clay soils often have an issue with not having good drainage. And then finally, what you're gonna do is you're gonna protect the plant's roots over the winter by insulating the soil from freezing. Sometimes you can get those frost heaves where you get the soil raising up and you can see all the ice crystals. That's breaking apart plant roots and that's disturbing the microbiome around the plant roots. All the, uh, the small microorganisms that live there and benefit the roots and help feed the plants from that organic matter. So I think that wood chips, especially arborous wood chips, like when they take down tree branches and then chip them up into the back of a truck, would be a great addition for clay soil. Not only that, but One, in the summer, they actually do cool the soil surface down and retain moisture in the soil. Sorry, Deb, go ahead. Well, no, one caveat about, the, about wood chips, be sure that you're just using them as mulch on the surface. Don't work them into the soil. Yeah. Working them into the soil as they decompose, they rob nitrogen from the soil. So be sure you're just mulching the surface with wood chips. And you can do up to about a four inch layer and it's very, very beneficial. All soils actually, but it's really good for clay. Great answers, everyone. Um, okay, this one's kind of related. We see a lot of people using bark, quite often colored bark over the soil to keep in moisture, reduce weeds, etc. Will mushrooms, uh, mushrooms seem to grow in this bark, I think is what they're saying. Is this okay or preferred not to have mushrooms? Also what to do with last year's bark after it has become sparse and discolored? Is it a constant remove and replace the bark each spring? What are good fast growing ground covers that could be used instead? I have seen slash used a Junga bungleweed and need a lot to cover everything and takes a few years. Could I tackle this one? Yeah, of course. Uh, I arborous wood chips are the very best mulch you can use. They 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 do all the good things mulch needs to do. Plus, they're a really good source of new added uh, micro microbiome to your to your microbiome in the soil microbes. The problem with using bark as a mulch, and I I really discourage people from using any form of bark as a mulch for a couple reasons. While it does moderate soil temperature, it does control weeds, it helps protect from pounding rain. Its bark is hydrophobic. It repels water. If you think about what it's doing to protect the outside of a tree, it has waxy substances in itself that repels water. And once the bark mulch gets dry, it's very, very hard to re-wet it. So the water, rain or anything, is going to tend to just kind of run right off. So it's kind of just defeating your purpose. Number two, arborous wood chips will actually feed your soil. The microbes under the soil will decompose it and feed your soil. I think of bark mulch or bark chips or any, any bark product as some kind of fast food. It's pretty nutrient empty. So the microbes will work on it and decompose it, but there's very little nutrition that's going to go into the soil from the bark. I frankly think that that bark mulch was invented by the timber industry when they had this waste product and they told us this was going to be a good thing for your garden. In some ways it is. It's better than no mulch at all. But if you can avoid using bark mulch and use arborist wood chips instead, you're going to be way better off. Now, to answer your question, the dyed uh, bark, first of all, you're introducing an artificial dye into your soil, which I don't think is 
a good idea, especially if you're growing food crops. Um, and anytime you have a mulch that starts to get thin, what's happened is it's been decomposed from underneath and turned into soil. You don't have to take it off of there. If you need more mulch, just put mulch right on top. Just put new mulch right on top. Preferably arborist wood chips, not bark. But if bark is the only thing you can get, it's better than no mulch at all. Mm -hmm. Now about the mushrooms. Mushrooms are not bad. Mushrooms are the fruiting bodies, the flowering bodies that create spores for the um, mycorrhizae. mycelium and mycorrhizae that grow underneath the soil. And they are part of the microbial life of the soil that decomposes things and makes nutrients available to your plants. They're not bad. Don't worry about them. The other thing, if I might add, with uh, bark mulch is being here on the island and during fire season, bark mulch will catch fire very easily, especially in cities and towns where people are smoking and they just flick their butt into your perennial bed. Well, then you may end up with a fire. So bark mulch in itself, I wouldn't use it. Uh, but like I said, uh, fire smart, be fire smart. I just want to add on one thing about the mushrooms. Often people will be concerned that there's mushrooms growing in any kind of mulch that they have. And it really just tells you that you have a good environment where you have organic matter and you have beneficial fungi breaking down that organic matter and feeding your plants. So if you see mushrooms in your garden or your friend's garden, it's something to be excited about. Don't they're eat your, them. No. They're your, they're your friends. You know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. As if we could have a yard without mushrooms too. So it's good to embrace our moss and mushrooms. <laughs> uh okay great um the there was one any uh two word answers on a a good ground cover that could be used instead of arborist chips i like i like thyme there's a whole bunch of different ones there's woolly thyme and red thyme and elfin thyme and and they they're just so faithful and they live through the winter and and Red thyme blooms in the spring and woolly thyme is gray and fuzzy. They're lovely. They're absolutely lovely. And they will fill in a space fairly rapidly. I, I think they're lovely. They're they're one of my favorites. And they're low. They don't they don't grow up high. And you don't have to do anything to them. They just they're just lovely. If I could add something about mulches, mulches don't have to be uh organic. They could be gravel. You got to be uh -huh. careful about the gravel, though, because it's a heat sink. I know. And that's what I'm talking about, that there are some perennials that love that heat. That's true. So you have heat loving perennials. And if you have a nice uh, rock base or a crushed gravel base or those little pebbles, it actually adds heat to the soil, warms up faster in the spring, as does a sandy soil. And uh, it allows the plant not to be sitting right on bare earth where some of the uh, fungi or anything can get at them and destroy them. There's uh, some of the spurge, which is euphorbias, would prefer that type of uh, uh, rock mulch. mulch on the we, we, we could do a whole presentation just on mulch. I think we should. I think that needs to be on the slate for next because there's a lot of soil questions in here. Mariah, do you have a favorite ground cover? You're, you're muted, Mariah. You're muted. I don't actually, sorry. That's okay. Deborah's enthusiasm for time is enough for us, I think. Okay, so... Um, Lee asked, can fresh wood chips be used? So is that what you mean by arborist chips? Like your neighbor's taking you on the tree and you're like, can I have that? Well, oh, yeah. it's, it's important. The wood chip part is important. It's, impor it's important that they're coarse. They're not little. Yeah. But they okay. also should have leaves and green and needles and things mixed in, not just wood. Okay. They're, if they're, they're better if the green is mixed in with. And most arbors, uh uh, wood chips would have that in because oh, yeah. you know, they're going out and cutting down trees or you know 
pruning them under hydro lines or whatever, and it's right. got all that organic, good organic material in it. But but if you're creating your own wood chips in your workshop, there's not going to be any green matter. I mean, that's no. probably better than no mulch at all. But if it's if you've got the green matter in it, it's going to be more beneficial for your soil. Now we're talking wood chips, not sawdust. Right. Yeah. Right. You want to put sawdust in any large amounts on your soil. No. And ground up leaves are also okay as mulch? Yes. There's even no Leaf reason mold. to grind them up. Just lay, just lay the leaves on, on the soil. You don't need to go to the bother of grinding them up. Well, unless you're actually gathering them from your lawn or something like that. What I do is I just go over the lawnmower with them, pick them up, and then just dump them on the beds. You know. Yeah, yeah you could do that. You can also just kind of, I just kind of rake them into my flower beds in the fall. Either way is fine, however much work you want to do. But yeah, well, leaves are great mulch. They will be gone by the next year. Yeah, and the other thing is, is, this is what the natural forest does. Yeah. You try know, to this isn't brain science. <laughs> it's yeah. basically try to replicate the cycle in the forest. Of, exactly. Of things falling and laying on the ground and then being decomposed and returned to, this, to the plants. And then they make new leaves and those leaves fall. It's a cycle. If you can replicate that in your yard, your your garden will be a lot uh, healthier. Yeah. I think these are Mariah questions. Um, they're asked, people are, two people are asking about um, soil testing kits and how to tell what type of soil they have. Yeah, I, I did see a question that was about testing your own soil or determining what type of soil you have. And there is something you can do at home called a soil texture analysis. And quite simply, what you do is you take a large glass jar and you fill it one third with soil from your garden. And there's instructions for collecting that. So you can look that up online. But basically, you're going to take a sample of soil, put it in the jar and add water and shake it up. And the largest, heaviest particles will fall first. So you'll see sand at the bottom, then you'll see silt, and then you'll see clay. And when you look at those proportions, it can tell you whether you have soil that's mostly sand, clay, maybe it's loam. We know that loam is 20% clay and 40% silt and 40% sand. So that's kind of an ideal, but you can do that simple test and it'll give you a sense of what your soil is made out of. And then you know which direction to go if you wanna add any amendments. Thank you to that person that suggested composting and mulches. We've already done composting, I believe. So if you look back, yeah. uh, we haven't done mulches. Love, I think Mariah should do one about soil next next season. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Bye -bye. <laughs> Excellent. Well, folks, we don't want to scare her away. No, we're not uh, going to scare her. Any concerns about disease with arborist wood chips? None. None whatsoever. None. None. Okay, great. No. Is it true that cedar chips needles are not good for mulch? Not true. No. Not true. Not true. Not true. Every kind of green arborist mulch that has leaves or needles and the wood in it is good. They're if awful. it was bad for plants, you wouldn't see these trees in the forest with plants under them, right? right? Everything would be dead under them. And we don't see that. Is that agreement, Mariah? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> We've got three people. Well, and, and people have commented in the past, they're worried about um, uh, arborist wood chips from evergreen trees making the soil too acid. Our soil is already acid. It does. on the doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So you're not going to make it more acid. And no questions about acid soil because Mariah is going to do her thing next year. So you have to. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's blitz the last few questions. Um, what is a good way to deal with grubs? Crows have destroyed part of some lawn in search of them. Oh goodness. Nematodes can be treated. Some nematodes uh, will actually uh, infest the grubs and kill them. Um, I wouldn't be planting a lawn because then you get lots of grubs, but it's just something you have to deal with. I don't know if there's any real way of getting rid of grubs in the soil. Well, I, I think if your lawn is really healthy and really thick and lush and you're not mowing it too short, you're not going to have as big a problem with pests of any kind. Yeah. Your grass is, grass is going to be healthier. And if you don't mow your grass any lower than about three inches, 
then I don't know that the crows are going to be able to dig down into that if the grass is a, is a bit high. A lot of people think that you need to mow quite short, but no, the grass is much healthier. You won't end up with thatch or anything if you if you keep it at about three inches. So let it get to be three and a half or four inches before you mow and then do mulching mowing that mulches up the clippings and returns it to the grass to fertilize it. And well, I, and and that it just make your your grass really healthy and I think you'll solve your grub problem. Yeah, the other thing is inviting natural predators into your yard like birds and stuff like that. That's what they do in nature. So, you know, we always want these gardens to be perfect. But you show me a perfect garden and I will show you somebody who's either using herbicides, insecticides, or anything else like that. Use natural predators. That's what they're there for. Okay. Anything to add, Mariah? No, I would just, uh, if I'm jumping ahead, I know that there's another ah. question about the difference between beneficial nematodes and then the ones that would cause root knot. And so to just kind of answer both is essentially there are tens of thousands of types of nematodes. They're worms and they feed on different things. And what they feed on depends on, will determine whether we think they're beneficial or not. So if they're feeding on grubs in the lawn, and that's one option is to spray the lawn with beneficial nematodes, then that we're considering that beneficial. Whereas if they're feeding on plant roots and they're a plant parasite, then we're considering that to be a pest and a problem. And the biggest problem with the uh, root knot nematode is that it's not just feeding on the plant roots, it's actually going inside the roots and feeding yeah. them. So it can be quite destructive that way. Excellent. Would you like a, to pick another question to answer? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Like Jeopardy. <laughs> uh, we are kind of at the end of our time. Um, let's end with a school question. What's yeah. the difference between a red seal horticulturist and a master gardener? Don't know. I have no idea, but like a red a joke, seal would, to me would say that they've gone through some higher accreditation than what we have. Uh, master gardeners, it's not a university type course. It's basically to give you the information you need to be able to suss out what is right for gardening and what is wrong for gardening. It gives you that ability to, uh, well, general knowledge basically about gardening and stuff like that. So a red seal, it'd be like a red seal cook or a blue seal cook. I don't know what that is. Master yeah. Gardeners, we, we do a, 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 garden, a course on advanced gardening through Vancouver Island University. That's a regular university course. And after we finish the course, we do two years of internship under the guidance of a certified master gardener where we volunteer and we advise the public and we learn um, how to do research and find answers to things and our learning never stops we are always learning yeah, at the Lynn's end of, that, just, at the end of the two years we get become a certified master gardener and our whole thing is is we're always trying to learn more but we also know how to find the answers to things exactly so we don't have a university degree, but we're passionate gardeners who want to volunteer and give back to our community. So, and we've had some training to do that. Yeah, there was an answer. Uh, Lynn said uh, that the Red Seal is something that's across Canada and it just gives you accreditation throughout Canada, basically. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. I might add that I would suggest that the Red Seal horticulturist would be a profession. You would be going to school probably for at least two years and to get a, a, a certificate and it would be uh, standardized across Canada. Whereas the master gardeners that I'm learning is really a volunteer organization where they're putting a lot of effort into community events, going and answering people's questions, holding classes like this. Their training comes mainly from experience. We then do do a university course for three months that helps you know fill in any of the gaps. But we all are quite passionate about plants and gardening. And that's where a lot of our knowledge comes from is we're just experimenting and, and gardening every year and learning what we can. If you look behind me, that's passion. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we end with uh, your favorite flowering perennial? 
from each of you? Oh my goodness. I'd have to say my Cheyenne spirit echinacea that I started from seed a few years ago. They are absolutely magnificent. And I had three plants last year and they made about 40 babies. Oh, wow. What color are they and where do you live? They're, 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 <laughs> they're a range of, of magenta and, and orange and burgundy. And they're, they're just stunning. And they're about three feet tall. And I, I love them. I just, yeah. Great. Repeat um, the name one more time for those of us who didn't quite yeah. catch it. It, it's echinacea and the variety is Cheyenne spirit. Cheyenne spirit. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, they're amazing. Mine would be delphinium sky blue or blue sky, which I started from seed many years ago. And the color of the flower is just incredible. And uh, it's a long lasting perennial. It's one of those ones that you can start from seed. Uh, beautiful when they're flowering, but actually not so beautiful uh, in late summer when they're looking pretty straggly. So these things, I would be planting them at the back of the herbaceous border. So they actually, you can see them, but in front of them, you've got things that will uh, cover up the, the nasty looking uh, stems later on. Excellent, oh. Mariah. He stole it from me. I love delphiniums as well. For me, it's blue flowers and delphiniums really cover the blue flower. Oh, they do. So pretty. And you can collect seeds. If you have some seeds from those, either one of you, I'd love to get some. Okay. Just saying. And I have okay. some, I have some echinacea babies I could give you. Okay. Now there's an idea. That's a tradesy. Okay. <laughs> I think this is we may have to have a plant swap or something after this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, can you bring to the table, Darby? <laughs> what? Mm, what? Chicken soil? <laughs> There's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, everybody, for attending. And um, thanks for sticking it out to the end. Everybody always has such great questions. We didn't get to all of them, which oh. means we had too many great questions for the time allotted, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful problem. We'll send out the uh, video for this session. So if you want to share it with a friend, um, we could do that. And you can find them on YouTube and on the library's website. Um, again, thank you so much for uh, Mariah did great and Deborah and Richard. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.